For now, we covered modeling for simulation, modeling for control, and now modeling for design. Uh, we'll cover direct in inverse design task, what it is. Um, okay, so we will start with the motivation. It's like when we have some idea, first of all, we can do a simulation in order to check this concept. For example, here you can see a, a mechanism of a finger for anthropomorphic gripper that grasping an object. We can create the design, we can build a, a real prototype, we can test, and somehow maybe it do not uh, behave in a way how you want it, it to behave. And you need start to iterate as uh, many times as it possible in terms of your time, your efforts, until you uh, find uh, something that is pretty useful. The number of iteration uh, influence and affects how much uh, uh, efforts we spend and how much time do we spend, how much uh, money do we spend on uh, designing something. And our motivation is to decrease amount of iteration such as we can get the efficient design very fast. So this is the motivation actually what we want to do. For example, Right here, you can see the trajectory. Let's assume that we want to create a mechanism that just follow this trajectory. What can we use? What do you think? We want some kind of mechanism that follows this trajectory. Four more mechanisms. Okay. Maybe something else? 2D, 2D knowledge, uh, R. 2R. Uh, yeah, it's something that I expected. It's like the most uh, obvious way that, uh, I mean, I spent the whole lecture explaining you about this <laughs> mechanism. Um, okay. We can use it, but it means that actually we, uh, we can use uh, this kind of mechanism to to generate any kind of trajectory, planar tra trajectory within workspace, right? So it is a plus, it is an advantage. But the disadvantage is that I need to use two motors, two sensors, two, sen two motors, it means that I need to control them. And they as, as we can see here, the ca controller could be, uh, would be complex. Also, it costs energy cost, and uh, I need to buy two motors, two sensors. So, from those point of views, it could be not very good. Yeah, it's like your colleague just told us that it could be a four bar mechanism, right? And it's called Chebyshev lambda mechanism, uh, and it's is capable of doing the same trajectory, but it's not a universal anymore. But uh, in order to do the motion, I need to one motor, one sensor, and it means that I can spend less amount of founding in order to buy this motor, and uh, the control complexity will be much simpler. I just need one PID here without any model, right? Based. So here it's like uh, we have a task to follow the trajectory, and the solutions could be different. And those just were simple mechanisms. But in general, when we want to create something useful, we, do not, we don't have a clue how to implement it. It's like the whole guideline. Let's assume that we want to create a robot for a specific task. For example, we want to, create, to, want, uh, want to handle goods for pick and place operations. Or we want to create a robot for uh, logic locomotion or we want to create a mechanism for human assistance or any other kind of robot I don't know uh, so we need to specify what is the task 
And then we think about what kind of morphology can be used. Uh, maybe it's a serial mechanism. And uh, as you probably seen that most of the mechanisms in robotics are open chain mechanisms. Like this 2R robot or 3R robot. It could be a spatial mechanism. For example, in ledged robots also the open chain is the most popular one. Uh, so we need to think about what kind of uh, mechanisms do we need, how to implement it. Then we uh, dig into the details and we need to think about how many joints do we need, what kind of the joints, revolute joint, universal joint, prismatic joint, uh, cylindrical joint, uh, spherical joint. So maybe it's even not a discrete but continuous deformation. How many degrees of freedom do we need? Uh, what uh, will be the workspace for a uh, um, robot manipulator or a gate for a uh, legit robot. So we need to ask a lot of questions here. Uh, we need to do a lot of design choices. And there is no way to check. Is it a good design choice? It's like the space of solution is just wa waste. Um, uh, it is unbounded. And uh, somehow we need to do an effective choice here. So we can even go into the details and think about the geometry, materials, sensors, actuators, uh, power source, it is a battery or not, uh, a way of manufacturing the parts. Maybe we need to use a CNC machine or lathe or 3D printer. And after that, we can actually do a performance evaluation by means of simulation before creating an actual prototype. And if the performance is not good enough, we can uh, refine model uh, and we can tune parameters. We can make lengths uh, more longer or we can change the distribution of mass or we can change parameters of our controller, of our springs, or we can uh, tune the topology of mechanism. Instead of open chain kinematics, we can use a closed chain kinematics, and it affects the detailed design. Or we can go even further and redesign the whole thing. And so we need to do a lot of things here, a lot of design choices, and the uh, uh, bummer is that we still need to do this manually. We still need to do a lot of design choices manually, and uh, sometimes it's very tricky. But if we stick with the parameter optimization, we can use uh, optimization techniques. Uh, let us assume that this old, in quotes, old generation robots. By old, that means the current. Uh, so here you can see a picture of a typical robot manipulator, which is actually not a robot, but mechanical mechatronic device uh, that used in industry. And you can think, uh, and you can think about what are the criterions, why they look like this, because they were created in order to chase high speed, high velocity, uh, high accuracy, and um, uh, high payload. Because in industry, you need to do very quickly, very precise, and very fast, uh, and to repeat this uh, motion. Uh, if we we'll think about a robot that uh, could be used in our home uh, uh, in order to help us with our daily basis activities, we do not need high p precision, we do not need um, very high grasping activities. I mean, we do not lift 200 kilograms every morning, right? Uh, and do, we don't need uh, we don't need such characteristics. And 
in industry we use uh, hard links rigid links uh, with uh, only rotation on prismatic joints uh, we use open kinematic parallel chains uh, we don't have energy restrictions and we use fully activated systems uh, in order to chase those high speed accuracy low capacity and repeat repeatability and for now we have tools to model this uh, kind of robots it's like to uh, it took me only one lecture to explain you how can you use the position control which is like 90 percent of all kind of control which is used in industry for it's like in russia uh, welding is like 90 percent of um, all usage of robots and you do not need impedance control to do such kind of operations uh, <coughs> but if we talk about not the current generation of robots but the future generation of robots the future generation of robots is needed in order to take these robots from fact factory from laboratory into the places where uh, we need to tackle unstructured environment for example your home uh, a cafeteria it is unstructured environment and it's created for human not for a robot if we talk about walking robot, uh, it do not uh, need high repeat repeatability, but it has energy restriction. Uh, we walking by definition is not fully actu actuated; it by definition under actuated system, uh, and you have a lot of more constraints. So you need to be smarter. You need to be more effective. So, if we still tackle old generation, we pay with heavy bulky robots. We you need to use high sensors, high um, high uh, mo performance motors, and it's only to be able to operate in structured environment. Uh, in unstructured environment, your robot needs to be able to do um, passive interaction with the environment and only then it will be um, safe enough yeah uh, now in the modern robot it's now limited to outside of the factory environment yes uh, maybe the same uh, we can uh, we can upgrade the motor uh, robots in the factory field it's mean uh, what i'm trying to do say here that in factory and out factory they chase for different goals so in factory we need to produce uh, some piece of part uh, very quickly very precisely and everything is in is structured robot here uh, cnc cnc machine here details here there is no human and that's it if we want to take this robot out of uh, uh, factory now the system is unstructured we have uh, energy restriction because it's just limited with the battery right here we just plug in and that's it energy is not an issue but if it's e an issue we cannot use heavy bulky robots because it's consume a lot of energy we cannot use very high um, performance motors we cannot use uh, um, uh, high performance sensors because of its all weight mass dimensions so we need to be smarter for example we already know this trick with the feedback linearization and everything works great but the problem is that we waste a lot of energy to this to do this this kind of control so we take initially non-linear dynamics and we replace it with something linear which is uh, easy for us to control for example here you can see a robot Azimo, and it's very great. You know, it works like real human. And uh, uh, it's been done like 17 years ago, pretty long time ago. And it's not like we can see it out of street, you know. 
it's not like it become our reality. Why do you think? What is the reason? Actually, the reason that that thing way uh, needs energy in 20 times more than human. And that uh, backpack is nothing else as a battery. You know, uh, it do something that looks like a human walking, but actually it do a completely different thing. It do this linear, linear um, uh, feedback linearization to cancel the natural dynamics and replace it with something that could be controlled very easily. So these control techniques come from industry. And if we apply the same control for a new generation of mobile robots, it will be not effective. We can, so we pay it with energy. We can think about this problem from different point of view. For example, here. It's completely passive structure. There is no controllers, they even there is no uh, motors, there is no sensors. It's just a bunch of links with the masses and with the bearings. And it's able to walk from a small slope. And it's powered only by gravity. So you can see here something completely different. Something that been uh, created uh, with a different mindset, you know? And uh, if we you know, talk about some scientific point of view, in our laboratory we are creating new algorithms and methods that allows us to synthesize such things. I mean, to create a smart mechanics such as the robot will be more effective than with just an open schematic structure. And by means of simulation and optimization, we can control, we can create such a thing. So we do not have any time left, but let me finish the idea. So for the old generation robots, we have structured environment, contactless interaction, we use bulky robots with the open and parallel kinematic chains with just rotational joints and uh, without no energy restriction and only fully activated systems can be used. But for mobile robots, the environment is unstructured. Now we have a huge uh, limitation for the energies. We, we need to handle dynamic contact interaction. Without it, we cannot walk and we cannot interact with the environment physically. Uh, we need to be smarter in terms of mechanics and this is why we need to tackle close kinematic chains. We need to consider compliance into in, in the mechani mechanics. Uh, we need to tackle, uh, tackle elastic deformation and we need to tackle underactuation. For example, Robot Atlas if I do remember the uh, numbers, it has like 36 degrees of freedom and only 32 actuators. So it's also highly under-actuated system. And design of such a thing is, uh, is not a trivial task. And uh, the way how can we do this by means of simulation plus an optimization. So I'll come skip that. So, uh, if we go back to the schematic representation, the way how can we decrease the amount of interaction, it is optimization. So, in optimization, initially we have some initial parameters, we have system, and we tune those parameters until the behavior and performance of actual system is, uh, is the something that satisfies us. It's like in general. Uh, so it will be the last slide for today. Yeah. So direct design approach is the following. We have some parameters, just as we had it in, all, in simulation models that we already run. We have, some, we have some parameters. We do simulation. We can uh, consider the performance of this system, right? 
by means of plots, for example. Uh, but inverse design approach, it is when we uh, specify what performance we want, would like to have by means of cost function or reward, if you're familiar with the uh, reinforcement learning uh, definitions. And we do the optimization such as it will find us parameters that gives us the performance that we want. So this is the like motivation for the whole concept of optimization, but the rest of this <coughs> material we will cover uh, on the next lesson. Okay? <clears throat>